As I was preparing for today's message, I came across a very famous painting that depicts the passage that we're going to be talking about today. The painting is entitled, Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's painted by a man named Heinrich Hoffmann and completed somewhere around 1890 or something like that. It's a picture of the, the passage that we're gonna be looking at today. And as we will read, right after the Lord's Supper, right after that time in the upper room, Jesus and the disciples go out into the night and walk into the Garden of Gethsemane, and there he prayed. But as wonderful as this painting is, there's several things that are horribly inaccurate about it, and maybe, maybe you can spot a few of them. First of all, there's some sort of a weird incandescent light bulb behind Jesus' head. I'm not sure what that's all about. And if you look carefully, I don't know if you can see it from where you're sitting, but Jesus has very nice, soft, supple hands, doesn't he, for a carpenter? I think that's a little bit strange. And then he's just kind of looking up at this, at this glow, and he, I don't know, he has such a calm, serene, peaceful look about him. It's a great picture of a very peaceful prayer. But as we're going to see in today's passage, this painting has absolutely nothing to do with the description that the Bible gives us about that night. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, go ahead and open them up to Luke chapter 22. And we're gonna be starting in verse 39. Luke 22, beginning in verse 39. It says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer, he went back to the disciples and he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Now, we're going to focus on Luke's account of this time of prayer, but we're also going to be looking at descriptions of this exact same night, this exact same event from both Matthew and Mark. Because when you put the three of them together, you can see some nuances that you would miss by looking at just one of them alone. So let's break this passage down a little bit, beginning back in verse 39. Notice that in verse 39 it says, Jesus went out as usual. You might want to circle, underline, highlight that passage as usual to the Mount of Olives because that's going to become very, very important. It was his habit. It was his pattern. During that week, Jesus would leave the temple each evening and he would go out to the Mount of Olives. Luke 21 verse 37 says, and every day he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and lodged on the Mount called Olivet. Because it was a habit for him, because it was a regular practice for him. Judas knew that's where he's going. That's where he went every night. And so when Judas was ready to betray him, he knew exactly where Jesus was going to be. And the next key phrase that you want to highlight out of this passage is what he asked for the disciples to do in verse 40. He says, on reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. The King James Version says it differently, says, pray you will not enter into temptation. This is the key. 
do not fall into, do not enter into. Notice that it doesn't say, pray you won't be tempted. They're going to be tempted. There's no way around that. But he says, be praying that when this temptation comes, you don't enter into it. You don't fall into it. Pray for strength to remain solid in, in what you know, that your foundation is strong. Pray that you, you are able to resist the temptation because it is coming. This, too, is going to become very, very important. We're told from Matthew's description that, that Judas has already taken off. So Jesus and the 11 disciples now go out into the night air, into the garden, and he left most of them there. Then he took his three key advisors, James, John, and Peter. It seems like it's, it's his inner circle. And he took them a bit further. And he asked them to watch as he prayed. And he also told them to pray. Now we pick it up again in verse 41. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down. Again, circle, highlight, underline that. He knelt down and prayed. Now, here's, this is where the artist got that idea for that painting. He's imagining that Jesus is kneeling down and praying. This is the inspiration for that beautiful picture. Now, I remember as a child, I was taught, and, and maybe many of you were too, I was taught how to pray. I was taught that in order to pray the right way, you needed to kneel down beside the bed. You needed to fold your hands nicely. You bow your head and you close your eyes. Of course, we all know that. That's the way we probably most of us were taught. That is how you were taught to God. And for many of us, we kind of think, well, that's, that's how prayer works. That's how you plug in to talking to God. The reality of us is, and it's a very rare method of praying, even in the days of the Old Testament. In the days of Jesus, that is not how people prayed. This pattern, their, their typical pattern of prayer was to pray standing up, looking up, arms raised towards heaven. That is a, a typical posture of prayer in Old Testament and even in biblical, in, in Jesus' times. You, you talk to God, you keep your eyes open, and guess what? God still answered. He heard those prayers. Paul writes in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 8, he says, Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. You go back through the Old Testament, I did this week, and I, there's no less than 15 different references to lifting hands in prayer. Not folding them, not bowing your head and closing your eyes, lifting your hands in prayer. Now, there's nothing wrong with kneeling beside the bed. There's nothing wrong with folding your hands or, or bowing your head or closing your eyes. And guess what? There's nothing wrong with standing and lifting your hands before the Lord. There's nothing wrong with keeping your hands in your pocket and simply talking to God. There's nothing wrong with, with praying while you're driving. And if you're doing that, I'm hoping that you're not closing your eyes and folding your hands. You see, it isn't the posture that matters. What God's interested in is what's going on in your heart. But Luke is saying that Jesus knelt down. And so we get this picture in our minds of Jesus calmly kneeling down, folding his hands and, and looking up at, at heaven with his nice, beautiful, manicured hands. But listen to what Matthew says about this. Listen to Matthew's account of this night, found in Matthew 26, verse 37. He says, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And going a little further, he did what? He fell on his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it's possible, May this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, 
but as you will. Matthew gives a very different picture. Now let's take a look at Mark. In Mark chapter 14, verse 35, it says, Going a little further, he did what? He fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, this hour might pass from him. It's a very different picture than what Luke writes about kneeling. It's a very different picture than that painting, isn't it? This is not a picture of calmness and serenity. This is, this is not a picture of a peaceful Jesus folding his hands, kneeling by a rock with an incandescent light behind him. Jesus walked down and he literally fell to his knees as he collapsed in sorrow. He's absolutely anguished about what's about to happen. He knows what's, what lays ahead of him. Being crucified on a cross, a form of torturous death that was so bad that no Roman would ever, could ever be exposed or subjected to it. But it wasn't only the cross. He knew the burden of the sin of all mankind was going to be placed on him. He knew that there was going to be a separation from the Father. And in that moment of time, he was going to be exposed to the wrath of the Father. And knowing all of that, knowing what lay ahead of him, he walks down those stairs, out into the streets, and into the garden. Trust me, this was not a peaceful, serene look on Jesus' face. There was fear, there was panic, there was anxiety, there was anguish. There was a broken and sorrowful heart. How bad was it? It was so bad that Luke tells us that an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And even after that, he went back and prayed even more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling on the ground. And he will arise after that last prayer. And he will walk out to the disciples where he finds them sleeping. And now you understand why that painting, although it was beautiful, it has almost nothing to do with this passage and what happened that night at Gethsemane. So this morning I want to step back. I want to look at this prayer that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I want to see what it can teach us about praying those, those desperate prayers in our life, the times where, where just everything is going wrong, the wheels have come off, and we desperately need God. The deep, dark moments, and, and we're, we're broken. Nothing is making sense. It's those times in your life where you go, hey, God, you know... This isn't working. Is there a plan B available? And as I'm studying this, this text, I'm, I'm looking at this prayer by Jesus. And I find myself asking some questions. And there are things you might have asked too. I printed them on the back of your bulletin. And I've left you some blank areas where you can just write in your own answers. My first question is, what happens when God doesn't answer my prayers? Or at least not the way I want him to answer my prayers. What happens when I'm praying for something so hard, so fervently, and it just doesn't happen? How do we react to those times? Number two, what do I do when God says no? Because sometimes that's the answer. Sometimes, sometimes what I want is not what I should have. We've got kids that consistently ask for things that they shouldn't have. And you have to tell them no. Number three, what's the point of praying? I mean, if I'm pretty sure my prayers aren't going to be answered and they're not going to change my circumstance, why even bother praying? These are, these are great questions, questions we've all probably asked ourselves at one time or another. And right off the bat in this passage, we have Jesus praying something that I didn't really understand at first. He's praying that this cup 
be taken from him. And I kept thinking, what is, what is this with a cup? What, what is that all about? Well, actually, if you look at the Old Testament, you'll see that the image of a cup is used very frequently. For example, Isaiah 51, 17 says, Awake, awake, rise up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of His wrath. Jeremiah 25, 16 says almost the exact same thing when he declares, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath. The cup is, is God's wrath. The cup that Jesus asks to be spared of is, is the, the wrathfulness of an angry God. The whole reason Jesus came to earth, the whole reason that he took on the form of a man, the reason he had preached and taught and healed for three years, it's all pointed, it's all climaxed, it's all come to this, this very point, this night of his existence. Quite simply, he came to die for us. He came to be our substitute. He came to pay the price that we could not pay for our sins. You think about a cup. Jesus came to drink the cup of God's wrath so that we would never have to taste it for ourselves. That's why he was born. That's why he came. And that's why he died on the cross. And now, just a few hours before the deed is to be done, Jesus prays in verse 42, Father, if you're willing, take this cup, the cup of your wrath, take it away. Let me ask you something. Do you think that Jesus thought his prayer was going to change his destiny? I mean, did he believe that there was a plan B? Did he, did he actually believe there was another way to get the job done? I don't think so. Okay, so if he doesn't believe that there's a different way, then why is he praying this prayer? What, what's the whole point of the prayer if he knows that the outcome is not going to change? If Jesus knew the Father was going to deny the request, if He knew the Father was going to say the answer is no, you have to go through this, if He knew that it wasn't going to change His destiny, why pray? When we pray those desperate prayers, we have to understand that prayer isn't always about changing our circumstances or fixing our problems. Sometimes prayer is simply about connecting with God. It's about connecting with His comfort. It's about connecting with His will for our lives. But I can't always get what I want when I pray. I can't avoid danger. I can't avoid pain. I can't avoid suffering. I can't avoid even death. And if I can't avoid all these things, even if I earnestly pray, my obvious question is, then what's the point? Why pray? And the answer is sometimes, sometimes prayer does change circumstances. I've seen it many times where prayer has brought healing. I've prayed over men and women with cancer and, and, and prayer changes it. I truly believe that. I've seen times where prayers are indeed answered for rebellious children, for marriages, for families. I've seen times when prayer have brought, have brought people, ones I love, back from the brink of death. But I've also seen and I've also experienced times when prayer has a very different purpose. The purpose of prayer, well, I came across a poem last week that really, really kind of helped me clarify it for myself. Here's what it says. Sometimes God stills the storms of the sea. At other times, He stills the storms within me. I love that. This time of prayer gave Jesus strength. 
This time of prayer gave Jesus courage. This time of prayer gave Jesus the power to face the pain and the humiliation and the horrors of the cross. Man, that's the kind of prayer we need to learn how to pray. It's a type of prayer that can give us the ability to face those, those hardest times of our life, the times where you just, you don't want to do it. And on your own, you can't. There's several things about Jesus' prayer that if you really break it down, it can actually help our prayer life as well. Things that give us strength and courage when we need them. And the very first one is very simply this. Be honest. Be honest in your prayers. When Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was brutally honest. This is the very first element of Jesus' prayer, his honesty. He didn't sugarcoat it. He prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. He knew what's about to happen. But he also knew that it had to be done. Both Matthew and Mark will tell us that he prayed this prayer three separate times. He's essentially saying, I don't know if I want to do this. I mean, I know this is why I'm here. I know this is the plan, but I'm looking at it right in the face now, and I don't want to do this. It's funny, there's people who believe that if they tell God honestly how they feel, that he's going to get mad at them. I mean, we can tell him he's great, we can tell him that he's mighty, but don't you go telling him that you're mad at God, because he's going to strike you dead. And so we're afraid sometimes to be open with God on how we really feel, our questions, our fears, our complaints. It's okay to be honest with God. In fact, anything else isn't a prayer, it's a fraud. The second thing about Jesus' prayer, be brief. God is not impressed by how long I can pray. God's not impressed by how long of words I can use in my prayers. It doesn't have to be a long conversation. As a new Christian, I remember I was, I was kind of freaked out about prayer because I, like I would try to talk to God for a really long time. And, and, and I would start talking to Him, and before I knew it, my mind is way over here. I'm thinking about five other things. Look at Jesus' prayer. It's, it's simple. <coughs> Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. But not my will, but yours be done. That's it. In fact, if you go through a scripture and you look at times Jesus has prayed, you look at even other prayers, they're very, very brief. There's a couple of long ones in the Old Testament, particularly when Solomon's, Solomon is dedicating the temple to God. But, but other than that, man, almost all the prayers in the Bible are short. They're, they're to the point. John 17 is Jesus' longest prayer. I timed it this week. It's called his high priestly prayer. One minute, 42 seconds. You pray longer for food than that. People, there's no value in the length of your prayers. It's not about how many words you can say to God. He already knows. I remember when I was a, when I was a young man, I was at a Bible camp in, in one summer, and, and they taught us how to pray joy. Have you ever heard of that? Praying joy, J-O-Y. J for Jesus, O for others, and then Y for yourself. That's how I was taught to pray. So there's times that things are really heavy on my heart, and I really want to just, just pray to God. I'm like, okay, man, um, all right, let, let's get through this. Um, Jesus, Jay. Uh, okay, thanks for what you did, Jesus. Um, oh, 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 let's see. Others. I don't really care about others. Just, just bless others. Okay, just, I don't know them. I don't care about them, but just bless them. Now I want to get to what I really want, the why. It's almost, like I, it's almost like I'm trying to butter up God before I get to what I really want to talk about. And I'm sure he's up there, he's saying, Bill, just shut up. Just don't even, get to what you need. It's okay to be brief. Number three, 
Be humble. I love that, that ending. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. That's humility. The love of Christ shines bright even in the, dark, the darkness of Gethsemane. Rather than seeking deliverance, rather than seeking a, a legion of angels to come rescue him, Jesus says, it's, it's not about my plan. It's about the plan of the Father. He yields himself to the will of the Father. Jesus knows his place in the plan of God. He submits to the Father's plan. Paul says that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And in this dark hour of Jesus' earthly life, in verse 43, Luke says God sent an angel to minister to Jesus. And I'm reminded of that wilderness experience where Jesus was tempted. And at the end of that, Jesus was ministered to by angels. God sends an angel to minister to Jesus in Gethsemane as he takes the next step in submission Man, I've, how many times have we been there? I need courage. I need strength. I cannot face what's ahead of me without help. And God sends an angel. Have you ever been in a position where you knew that there's something you have to do? You don't want to do it. You're resolved that you, you don't want to go through it no matter how hard or how painful it is, but yet you, you need that strength, you need that encouragement, someone to just come along beside you and say, I'm there for you, buddy. That's humility. That's saying, you are God and I'm not, and I'm going to do it your way. If there's anything that goes on in the midst of a crisis, it's very simply this. We struggle. It's hard. It's painful. And if we don't have an understanding of prayer and we don't have a connection of God, it is very easy for us to, to start holding God responsible for what's happening. We begin to doubt His goodness. And at some point in our lives, I think every one of us is going to pray a desperate prayer. Maybe you already have. I hope it's not often. Maybe some of you have just come through it. Maybe some of you are in the middle of it now. Maybe for some of you, you have no idea, but it's coming and it's got your name written all over it. We will all be there. My hope and my prayer is that when that time of crisis comes to you, that you're prepared with the power of praying. My hope and my prayer is that we leave here this morning a little better prepared for what we know is going to come sooner or later. Because this, in this fallen world, it's inevitable that heartache is going to come. The great thing about Scripture, the amazing thing about Scripture, is it says that for those followers of Jesus, those hard times will not break you but rather they can strengthen you. People, it's so important to remember that how we prepare today is going to enable us to face tomorrow, no matter what tomorrow brings. Be brutally honest. Be brief. Be humble. And above all, we'll be able to say, yet not my will, but yours. Let's pray. Father, may we be a church that doesn't, doesn't fear the future, but simply looks for you. Father, in this time of, of divisiveness and, and angst amongst our world, Father, may we be pillars of strength, knowing you, walking with you, and talking regularly with you. Father, we know that the prayer is, is, is our connection, our plugging in to your strength and your power. And there are so many times today where we need that. 
Father, may this be a church of prayer. May we be men and women who regularly make it a habit to pray, just as your son did. And Father, may we collectively say, not our will, but yours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Thank you for being this morning. Please come back next week. But in the meantime, go out there and be a person of prayer.